The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest exporters of soybeans. China is the world's largest importer of soybeans. Mm -hmm. China was buying all their soybeans from the United States just as a way to kind of make it make it up a little bit. Like, well, we don't want we got to buy the soybeans anyway. Why not buy them from the U.S. to keep the U.S. China trade deficit under control so it doesn't become too politically toxic? Um, well, as soon as we Trump threw on the tariffs, China retaliated by moving their soybean uh, orders to Brazil. In this video, Jim Rickards discusses the massive disruptions in global supply chains caused by U.S.-China trade tensions. As China shifts soybean imports from the U.S. to Brazil, the entire logistics network is being restructured, leading to long-term challenges. Rickards predicts that rebuilding these supply chains will take over a decade and highlights the hidden costs of past efficiency-driven models. He also explains how these disruptions contribute to inflation and foresees a shift to a more secure but expensive supply chain model with implications for global trade and national security. Stop buying U.S. soybeans. Well, that's not a phone call. I mean, you're talking about vessels, port facilities, uh, Agriculture, you know, trucks, how do you get the soybeans to the ports? Uh, how many do you grow? Where's the fertilizer coming from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And all those parties, you know, the shippers, the cargo, the insurance companies, and there's so many people involved, banks, letters of credit, it's just a lot involved. Um, they don't like short-term relationships. They say, okay, I'll do it. I want a five-year contract. And China said, okay. So they reconfigured all those transportation lanes to get the soybeans from Brazil all of a sudden you're a U.S. soybean grower. You say, well, what do I do? Well, we start selling them to the Netherlands because the Netherlands needs soybeans too. So now, but now instead of shipping them from like Port of LA to Ningbo and near Shanghai, we're shipping them from Port of Houston to, I don't know, uh, France or Marseille or someplace uh, or, or Rotterdam. So the point being, um, you completely scrambled all these uh, supply chain relationships. I talked to the guy who, you know, like this is a worldwide endeavor, but he was probably the single most responsible individual for all the significant developments in the supply chain in the last 30 years. And he said to me, he said, Jim, you have to understand, it took us 30 years to build it. We blew it up in three years. It's not going to come back overnight. Mm -hmm. It's going to take 10 years or more to rebuild it. And what I talk about in the book is supply chain 1.0, which is 1989 to 2019. And then supply chain 2.0, which kind of starts now, but is going to go indefinitely because it's going to take a long time to put this together. It's uh, you know, it's like dropping a vase and it breaks in a, a thousand pieces. You can't put it back together. You got to go buy a new vase. And that's what's going on with the supply chain. The, there will be a supply chain. There always is. But the new supply chain will look very different from what we've just come through. Because the whole the whole 30 years of period I'm describing was built on efficiency. You know, lower cost, lower cost, lower cost. It was kind of the Walmart model. So, yeah, just-in-time inventory. Everyone knows about that. But there's something called cross-docking. That's where a truck pulls up at a warehouse and you unload it. And instead of putting the stuff in the warehouse, you move it to another truck that then goes to a destination. The stuff never goes in the warehouse. Inventories are very expensive. They're they're they're, they're costly to finance. You got to move the stuff around. It's called picking. You know, pick the stuff off the shelf with your. I used to drive a forklift, so I know a little bit about it. Uh, you know, and put it on a truck. Used to unload trucks too. So so, you know, hey, I've got seven suppliers. Why don't I cut it down to three and do bigger contracts with each one and get lower unit costs? I've got five transportation lanes. Why don't I cut that down to two? Get everything to you know Los Angeles and Seattle as the case may be, you know, et cetera. And they, they did it for three and they got costs lower, you know, and, and Walmart and Amazon were the champions of this, but everyone else was doing it. But they missed something. What they missed was that they're while they were getting those unit unit costs lower for consumers, they there were hidden costs. And the main hidden cost was you, you were creating greater frailty. This whole system was subject to a massive, massive breakdown. So, uh, you know, what happens if you have two suppliers and they both go on strike? What happens if you have one port of entry and it's backlogged? What happens if you've got uh, cross docking in warehouses and there aren't enough trucks? There's 80, there are 80,000, we need 80,000 drivers, 80,000 drivers. I wish they'd hire them instead of these IRS agents. But the point being, um, it, it is breaking down all across the board. Now, it can it be put back together? Yes, but the biggest difference between 2.0 and 1.0 um, this goes by different names. Uh, 
you know, Janet Yellen called it friendshoring and Macron called it a constellation of nations uh, club, if you will. So you'll still have trading partners. You'll still have outsourcing. You'll still have transportation lanes. Jim Rickards discussed major disruptions in global supply chains, emphasizing that rebuilding them will take over a decade. Following U.S. tariffs, China shifted its soybean imports from the U.S. to Brazil, causing significant supply chain realignments. Ricards highlighted the transition from supply chain 1.0, efficiency-focused, to supply chain 2.0, resilience-focused, predicting higher costs but increased security due to new trading blocks that exclude China. He also distinguished between cost push and demand pull inflation, noting that current inflation is driven by supply issues and forecasting a shift towards deflation as the economy enters a recession. But it'll be members only. It'll be basically democratic, kind of liberal republics, Western Europe, uh, you know, the EU, of course, uh, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, India, we expect to be included fr friendly nations, but China's out. We're decoupling from them. They're decoupling from us. This isn't US driven. The US is participating, but this is what China wants too. Both sides are decoupling as fast as they can. China can develop its own network, you know, maybe Central Asian Republic, some Southeast Asian um, you know, suppliers and so forth, but they're going to lose customers. Well, most of their customers actually in, in the United States, we won't buy their stuff and we won't sell them our stuff, particularly high tech stuff. So you, the world's going to break and, and these new clubs are going to be formed and there will be trade and there will be transportation lanes, but it'll be much more restrictive. Now, will prices be a little higher? Yes, but it'll be more secure. So the way I describe that you know, if you buy uh, insurance on your house or I buy insurance on my house, you don't want your house to burn down. You hope it doesn't. But if it does, you don't think your insurance premiums are a waste of money. Like when you write that check, you're like, that's money well spent. When you pay higher prices for consumer goods, the, the delta between the old price and the new price is your insurance premium for a more reliable system. And also, there's a big national security component to this. And I talk about Russia and Ukraine and China in the book. So that's all. Uh, so, so the, um, the the how the supply, you know, what the supply chain breakdown means. Chapter one, chapter two, what caused it, and we talked to, about that. And three, where is it going? Uh, what are the constraints? And we talked about that. But then my editor, who's love working with us, she said, "Well, Jim, we've got to be a, chapter, a chapter on inflation." I said, "Of course we do. You know, the supply chain breakdown is causing a lot of the inflation we see." And I'm going to write another chapter on deflation. And everyone's like, wait a second, why are you talking about deflation? That's coming next. People are not ready for it. I know the inflation's here. I buy gasoline. I, I shop in the grocery store. I get it. I'm not, it it's, and it's persistent. It's not transitory. I understand all that. But inflation has two major sources. One is the supply side, which is called cost push inflation. So that's energy price shocks, you know, the stuff we're seeing coming out of Ukraine, fertilizer shortages, strategic metal shortages, um, uh, you know, component suppliers who can't deliver stuff to factories in Germany and they're shutting down, et cetera. The other cause is from the demand side, and that's called demand pull inflation, basically psychological. Consumers pull demand forward. They're like, hey, I was thinking of buying a refrigerator. I better buy it today because the price is going to go up in six months. And the 70s, we had both. It started with cost push with the Arab oil embargo, but it ended up demand pull. Um, I was starting my career at the time. They your boss would just give you a raise. You didn't even have to ask. You know, inflation was gone up so fast. Like, I better give this guy a raise. It gives another, you know, 30,000 bucks or whatever because people would quit, you know, and uh, and that and that sort of spun out of control until Volcker squashed it all. Right now, we do not have uh, demand pull inflation. We don't. This, this is not what's going on. We do have cost push inflation. The difference is, is hugely important because cost push inflation from the supply side, which is, again, when I talk about in the book, it's real, prices go up, but uh, it's self-negating. You know, the old saying that, you know, the cure for higher oil prices is higher oil prices because when they get too high, people stop driving. They, they shut down um, various activities. By the way, if you're unemployed, you're not buying any gasoline because you're not going anywhere. I mean, that's, that's kind of a nasty way of putting it, but that's, that's how cost push inflation, <clears throat> pardon me, tips into a recession and then prices come down. 